but what I'm hoping you will do is you'll actually take one home and either email me or send me something with changes, particularly if you know something I've got dead wrong. Now, if, if I miss a comma, well, you know, or something, I, that's not so important, but we, I've got lots of proofreaders here helping me on comma, but, and I need the help. But uh, if you'd like to, to have a copy, you can take it with you. I'll be talking a little bit about it, but today's focus is going to be on the Rockner family, so we'll be doing the early part of it this morning. But let me, let me give you number one. Here's a, if you'd like to stay up all night in the archives in the spring, it's more of a killer. But uh, we've got to work out some of those, those different issues. Uh, I, I did not put in that we were a National Historic District, and they said that's, you know, I said, oops, oversight. And there are several buildings there that do have national, uh, that are on the re that are registered as national landmarks. Uh, so uh, I'll add that to, to the individual houses, too. But uh, we're going to talk mostly about the Rutgers, and I'm uh, maybe a little early, but I just thought I'd let that get out and people be able to get those. Let's see, has anybody been getting the handout? But, uh, I mean, it, it, uh, let me put it this way, it will be published, but now whether we get the grant or not, that will be something else. Uh, okay. Shall we just start? Are we at 10 o'clock? Just about. Well, if you all are ready, let's go on a wild ride. Uh, the topic is the Ruffner family and the early development of the salt industry. Now, I'm going to get us up to Booker T because that's kind of our, our big story, our, our national story. But the Ruffners come to America, and the gene pool comes with a fellow named Peter Ruffner. They're not sure if he came from, they even think maybe Italy, but he's German-speaking. He comes from, high German-speaking, he comes from probably Switzerland, maybe over in Germany, but somewhere there German-speaking. He comes to America, and uh, he, uh, sort of like George Washington, I call it the, handsome, good dancer uh, syndrome. He's, uh, he's tall, about 6'3", good-looking man, and he's here seven years, and then marries one of the richest men uh, in, in, in Lancaster County, which is Pennsylvania Dutch country, a daughter. And uh, he uh, uh, is there seven years, and the family, because some have speculated that maybe he was an indentured servant when he came. But, uh, and he goes to Pennsylvania Dutch country. Now remember, folks, Dutch is Deutsch, is German. So that's a huge German settlement. And his father-in-law was Mr. Steinman, Steinman. And he gave his, uh, his daughter and his new son-in-law a large patent that he got from George II in the Shenandoah Valley, oh, in the Valley of Virginia. You know, local historians do like to say Valley of Virginia. But uh, in the Valley of Virginia. And it was a German settlement. So they set up shop there. They have a number of children. And what's interesting is it's, it, is that the oldest child seems to be the one that kind of gets the property and gets things going. But they have uh, six children, and the oldest is Joseph. And uh, Joseph uh, expands the, the estate. He likes to buy property. He ends up buying something like four miles worth of property around Luray, Virginia. Yes, the Ruffners discovered it's called Ruffner Cave, but it's actually now today the Luray Caverns. Uh, so they're there, and things are happy. David is his oldest son. We all know David is the first salt industrialist we have. But David uh, is there. He's married. The other five sons are not married, uh, but they're all grown, living with Papa. And in, in, in 1794, two of their barns are burned to the ground. Now, uh, David has married a Mennonite, a German immigrant's uh, Mennonite minister's daughter, and her name is Anna Brombach. And so these folks, uh, uh, I saw one track where George Washington went into this area and tried to get the people, Mennonites, you know, were, were, were anti-war, and they also were anti-slavery, uh, tried to get some of these folks to help join the militia to fight the Indians, and they wouldn't do it. The Quakers were in the area too, couldn't get them to do it. It was very frustrating that George Washington couldn't understand. But, so, the, so, so Peter's there, Joseph gets his lands, yeah, pretty much, and uh, Peter does have other children, they go elsewhere. But, but Joseph is a major miller and sells everything over in Fredericksburg. And he has these huge Conestoga wagons like they used in Lancaster County. Six horses would draw these huge wagons covered with, with bear pelts. 
So, in, so there, David is, their family is German speaking. David Ruffner speaks his whole life with a slight German accent. He learns English from a store, spoken English from a storekeeper in the area uh, who was a Scotch Irish. He uh, uh, has, has children, he has three children, and when his father, Joseph, says, hmm, we, two barns have been burned, he testifies against an African American. I don't know if he was a slave or not a slave. Some time before this, and there's a thought that perhaps this is the person who would burn two of his barns down. So he thinks, I, I, I want to do something different with my life. Now, at the time, I want to, I wrote this down. Uh, at the time, he's 55 years old, and he says, you know what, I think we'll go, go west. And so he, he gets on a horse by himself in the spring of, of 1794. Uh, and goes over to Clifton Forge, and he see and he he meets a fellow named Colonel John Dickinson. Now, please understand that there are two different Dickinson families coming from Virginia. One's from Bath, and one's from Bedford County, and it's accidental. And do they both marry Shrewsbury's? Oh yes, everybody marries Shrewsbury's. No question about that. Must have been lovely people. But anyway, so it, it, it gets it gets it gets so tangled. All right, now, so. He comes on horseback, and there's a wonderful account that he gets to the Gauley River. He's the first whitewater rafting person, perhaps. You know how we say that Mary Ingalls is the first salt maker in Malden. Well, here comes Joseph Ruffner, 55 years old, with a horse and a backpack or some sort of pack, and he has nails in it. And this fellow says that he sees him do this, that the water in the Gauley is hot. And uh, this is in the autumn, so you, you know, you, you're going to get some water. And what he does is he, he gets the nails out. He, nails up a raft, takes rope out, ties it to the tail of his horse, pushes the horse in the water, across they go, he gets across, the horse gets out, he gets out, he dismantles the raft, which was from, apparently from a, a fallen chestnut tree, dismantles it, puts the nails in his pack, and goes on. Okay, now this is after seeing Colonel John Dickinson. Well, what did Colonel John do? He saw a man coming with money, $2,000 worth of money, he says, look, you want to go into the iron business, but what you want to do instead is go into the salt business. Think about it. You could make salt at this buffalo lake, this salt spring, that I've got a patent of 502 on. <coughs> you know, riches are untold. So, here's, so sight unseen, he buys that 502 acres from John Dickinson. Doesn't even come over here, sight unseen. And he pays $2,000 for it, basically, which is a lot of money my thought, uh, but there's a little carrier clause on it that says that if you make salt and it's successful, then you owe us 10,000 pounds. No way. They, they show it as pounds, 600 pounds equals, they guess, about $2,000. If you can make salt on it, 10,000 pounds. Now, I can't do that math, folks, but we're talking not $2,000, but in the 20s probably. Lots of money with this rider clause. Well, okay, sure. So he goes over. When he gets here, he sees the Kanawha Valley. And who's here? You've got Fort Lee. We all know about Fort Lee. The Clendenins are here. There are like 12 men here. And some have families. And the Clendenins make up, and the, the brothers and dad, Charles, make up uh, half of the, the garrison here. Now, of course, Fort Pleasant's already happened. The Indians are no longer, the Native Americans are no longer a threat in the Ohio Valley because of what happened in Indiana at, uh, uh, with uh, Matt Anthony Lane. So it's safe here. The Clendenins set up a town. They lay out lots, and so actually the prior owners lay out lots right at the Elk River, where the Elk River comes into the canal. You see where they're building a new hotel, something like that, somewhere in, the, in that area. And they figure everybody's just going to run, you know, coming to the Elk River in Charleston, the Canal Salings, and we're going to do fine. <laughs> Nobody comes. Uh, there, is no, there are no people, settlers, Native Americans, or anybody else, that live between the mouth of the Elk River on the Canal and Point Pleasant. There is a settlement in Point Pleasant. <coughs> so there's nobody here. But Joseph, 55-year-old, thinking it's time for a new life, says, that's all right. So he buys a 1,000 acres and buys out the Clendenins and everybody else. So the Ruffners own from the Elk River, several miles up, 
and they own the 502 acres, which today is, everybody knows, at the coal depot at the mouth of Campbell's Creek, or as we say, at the Campbell's Creek stoplight. That's, <laughs> that's, that's its famous designation. Now, so he buys, and this guy likes to buy land. Within a year, he buys another 6,000 acres right below Point Pleasant. Now, he brings, he, and then he goes, of course, he goes back home. This happens in the spring. He goes back home and he says, we're moving. Can you imagine? I mean, the whole family he said, we're, we're moving. Lock, stock, and barrel. Six horse wagons, bear skins, the whole thing. So they move here in the fall of 1795. Now, I gave this talk a, a week or so ago, and, and I keep saying it's 1975 or something. So somebody, you beat my designated wrong century, Larry. But anyway, I get numbers mixed up. I'm dyslexic. But anyway, so 1795 in the fall, they come here. David, it takes a little while. He's got kids and a family, so he kind of ties up his affairs. He comes in 1796. Now, so what do they got? They've got the salt property, salt spring property. We call it the Buffalo Lick because it kind of takes us back to Native American days and Mary uh, uh, Ingalls uh, making salt there at the time. It's, it's really just an outcrop of salt. It's not very good. I mean, if you want to boil it down, it's not strong enough. So they figure, well, if we can just dig down a little bit, it may be good. Joseph has this dream of a salt industry. Joseph dies in 1803. I mean, he's only been here since 95. Since Here's this vigorous, healthy man who dies in 1803. Well, in his will, he says, okay, I'm going to divide up the, the lands basically between three sons. And uh, we should, I should say first here, where we sit is what Daniel got. And Daniel's the man who built Holly Grove, which is right there. That house is 1815. I don't know. I, in my brochure I had it's the oldest house in Charleston. I raised that out, but one of the oldest, because I'm not sure. I've read that it is. I don't, I don't know. 1850 is pretty early for any house in Charleston. He got that property because that's this is where David him, I'm sorry, this is where Joseph set up shop himself. There was a second little fort here. And this he made his home. When he dies, he gives everything, he makes his will a month before. He dies, so he must have known he was going. He makes his will and gives all of his personal property to his wife, his widow, and and then he, he gives the, the property where they live to Daniel, subject to a life estate in the in the widow. So she was to live here, and she does. She lives like another 20 years. She lives into her 80s. And uh, uh, so Daniel is here. All of the boys get a lot in town. David gets the balance of the lots, David being the oldest. David and all six boys are jointly given the salt spring because, because Joseph wants the family to develop the salt industry. He has the vision. Well, David and Joseph II are the ones who decide we're going to do it. And I cannot understand. The more I read about what it took for them to drill through something like 50-some feet of bedrock to get to this salty brine, I don't, I don't understand how they did it. I don't understand why they did it. But they were rough. They were special people. Okay. So they dig the, uh, the way they do it is they have a, an 18 foot sycamore tree gum. They hollow it out and they build an 18, it's 18 feet long, and they, they build an 18 foot frame to hold it up. I mean, that's no small tag, that's a big tree to hold up. They build this frame of 18 feet, they get a spring pole. You know, the, where you have a pole and you have a long pole and then you have a, a rope down. And they get this spring pole to take stuff up and down to the man who is in the tree digging. It takes them months and months. But the reason they keep going, this is real important, is the deeper they go, the thicker and stronger and richer the salt is. And they know, look, we can't make salt here on the surface. Who is our first salt maker? I had in my I had in my brochure I said first in salt industrialist. David was the first. David was the first salt industrialist, and I was helped by some. But then another place I said first salt maker. Wrong. The first salt maker was Elijah Brooks. Why? Because Joseph leased the salt spring to him to make salt. What did he do? He got kettles like this, put some lumber under it, made some salt, sold them. To a little bit. I mean, it was a small. It wasn't industry. Industry, that's for sure. So they go down, and there's there's one account that says it takes like like that's something like eight to ten hands. Now, does that mean is that one person or, or, or is that eight to ten people or, or four to 
to five uh, people. I, I don't know, but pans to dig this. And they keep going and they go down. And, <clears throat> and they use some primitive tools, and it's not like they're using a spoon or anything, or wood. They have some drill bits. There's a black smithery in West Virginia. And, and the old model was a very, very important, not just for shoeing horses, but for <coughs> almost everything you needed to come from them. So Joseph gives the property. David and Joseph II drill down. It's 1807. They, it looks like they're really going to make it. And by the way, the first time they set up that whole operation, they went down, they hit bedrock, and they said, oops, let's move. So they moved it over, and they set it all up again, start going down, hit bedrock again, and they go, well, <laughs> let's go back to where we were, because it was the water was running pretty good. We've we got to go through bedrock. We'll go through bedrock. So they, but in, in, in the fall of, 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 18, of 1807, now, so you get a perspective. Thomas Jefferson is president of the United States. Lewis and Clark just came back in 1805 from the Northwest. Uh, further identifying to the, to the roughness, look, we, with this river out here, we can ship salt to Montana, which wasn't even named. We can ship it to New Orleans. So the river was the, was the, the mastery of this whole industrial setup. So they, by, in the February, I think it's February 1st, anyway, February of 08, they actually start production. They build, and in the fall they say it's going to work, they build a, 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 they start building their kettles. It's a pretty rough operation at first, but they start producing enough salt that they reduce the price of salt from $5 a barrel to $2 a barrel. And so they basically start making the monopoly. By 1815, this is, somebody help me with that, seven years after they go down here, there are 52 salt furnaces on the Kanawha River in this Kanawha segment. What happened? Well, the, the War of 1812, a lot of the salt was imported from, well, if you remember salt was, was one of the, there was a duty on salt, and that's why we threw everything into the first tea party, threw it into the, into the Boston Harbor. Uh, the, 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 uh, uh, and the British imported a lot of salt, especially along the seaboard. But once the War of 1812 started, there was no more importation of salt, which was wonderful for us. You know, sometimes you can make money on war. Well, they made it. And so they had unlimited uh, monopoly on salt production, particularly in the West. But they also had wagons that took it east. I mean, they sold on the East Coast, too. So they become very wealthy. Uh, uh, and, and, and 1817, David Ruffner says, you know, I, we, I just can't afford to keep paying for the lumber that goes under these farms. We've got to come up with some better way of doing this. And these farmers are getting out problems of coal. Why don't we use coal? So the Ruffner family <coughs> starts the coal industry in West Virginia as a fuel source for their furnaces. Doesn't work very well. Why not? The coal slide gets on the grates or something. I'm, I don't, my brother's the engineer. I don't understand exactly. But, but it built up coal slide and they couldn't get it off. It would damage the, well, who else? 1828, Dr. Henry Ruffner, who was one of the people in that gun when he was 17 years old, by the way. Dr. Henry Ruffner, well, he's not doctor then, but in 1828, he comes up with an innovation that eliminates the coal slide. And so then everybody uses coal. Now, this is a man who, I mean, Henry, we're going to talk about in a second, but I mean, he is, he is the genius. Anne Royal in 1826 writes a, a book about the canal sailings and everything. She says, there's only one genius here, it's Henry Ruffner. She was right. Uh, <clears throat> but anyway, so, so in 1817, we start coal, but something even more important, perhaps, to the history of America happens. There's a fellow, there's a fellow named Joseph Love, whose father is an English lord. He dies in England. He and his sisters come with their mother, who marries a merchant named James Breen. Breen, I don't know. Okay. Big, really wealthy man. I mean, this fellow was, had unbelievable wealth. He lived in Richmond. Joseph Lovell comes over. He's an attorney. And the Lovell family is still here. I had the privilege of actually holding a letter, I get this month, that Joseph Lovell wrote to James Green, his father-in-law, saying, we have organized the Kanawha Salt Company by organizing the salt makers into a trust. Well, he doesn't use the word trust. Into an association 
so that we can make salt more profitable. Well, what was happening? By 1817, they were cutting each other's throats. There were too many furnaces. But instead of $2 a barrel, they were, getting, they were getting under 50 cents. I mean, problems were happening. Joseph Lovell is a legal genius. Now, we've got some lawyers in the room, and I see one or two. We can appreciate how, in this time period, and, and they, by the way, in law school, they don't teach you the history of law unless you just want to reach out and, and bring it to, your, to yourself. That's not a, a, a key subject. But in the history of the law, uh, there are no business trusts until Joseph Lovell invents this, this <coughs> cartel for the Canal Salt Company. Well, what does it do? They said, look, we, we all make the same product. Why don't we do this? Why don't we fix prices, select markets, and limit production? Keep the price up, everybody gets rich. We all get rich together, instead of cutting throat, we're happy. We're, always remember the Dickens and Shrewsbury's, that, that firm never went into it, but they did individually, but not that firm. So in 1817, the Canal Salt Co Company is formed here, association is formed here, it's called a company, but it is an association of salt producers and is the first business trust in the history of the world. Okay, you go, oh, come on. See, what the roughners are doing, and what these people here are doing, is everything they do is the first ever done. Because, because they're on a frontier, not a frontier of woods and trees. They're on the frontier of industry, of social <coughs> relations, worker relations, on the, the frontier of religion and churches and schools and everything we see today. They were pioneers. They had to just do it. All right. So you've got, the, and, the, and of course David's right in the middle of it. So David and, and the Ruffners are, are a part of the Salt Company, the first business trust. And when I say business trust, you know, this is what the Rockefellers, the Goulds, the Hannas used at Carnegie, used uh, uh, to control production and to get rich at the turn of the century. We outlawed it, Sherman Antitrust Act and, and other laws. It's, it's illegal in America, but every time you pull up to a gas pump, folks, you are there for the Kanawha Salt Company. Just wish we had the money. But the International Oil Cartel uses exactly the same concept to be formed. But also, and this was something, John Steely's the only historian who's ever come to the Kanawha Valley that I'm aware of who did, has done original research. He has wonderful books. If you haven't read them, you've got to. He's got one on the, he calls it the prelude to the Kanawha Salt Monopoly. I can't remember the name of the book. His book names are always very long. But he writes about the Kanawha Business Trust and identifies uh, uh, that it is the first, there were thoughts that it was formed after the Civil War because it became popular after the Civil War. His research shows that it was done here first. Uh, but also, he, he discovers that you know, it used to be when you had a corporation, the legislature would vote it, just like the Virginia Company and the, the, uh, the, you know, the King's Grants and all that coming across here. The Virginia legislature was real slow to grant some of the things that they wanted done, so they formed their own corporations with shares, well, with partnership shares, basically. So they are also at the, at, on the pioneer, on the frontier of legal corporate form. And, and, and uh, again, only a lawyer can appreciate that, but you know, whenever you, you start developing something as, as common as corporations, it's, uh, it's important. All right, so we, we've got the Ruffners there set up. I like the idea of breakfast at the Ruffner house. You've got David, and you've got, and by the way, that he, he lived in town at the time because there's no mall, there's just that salt spring up there. David, his wife, the daughter of a Mennonite minister. You say, Larry, that's the second time you've said that. I know I say it three times, I think, in the brochure because I'm trying to get it into my brain. It matters. And then you have around the breakfast table, you have Henry Ruffner, one of the most remarkable people in the history of Virginia and West Virginia. You've got Lewis, his seven-year younger brother, who, of course, married uh, Shrewsbury, then married Viola, and they're the, the household for Booker T. Lewis was the industrialist and, and took over the companies in the 19. In 1823. Then you've got Ann Ruffner, who marries Dr. Richard Putney. And everybody might remember the Putney house that was the Coleman and Jeter law firm, and now the Coleman family lives in the, in the house, the beautiful federal style white brick uh, in the middle of Malden. Uh, and and, uh, and he's the, Dr. Putney is the one who helped lay out Malden as a salt for a subdivision with David Ruffner and so on. And, uh, so, you, you know, that breakfast table has some of the most important people 
in the history of this area, but also in the history of the state of West Virginia and of all of Virginia, and in the history of the country. All right, you say, oh, now Larry, wait a minute now. Well, let me just do this with you. The Ruffner family has pioneered, in the brochure you'll see it says, the Ruffner family has pioneered every single thing that you see here. Everything. You say, well, they were the first. Like, well, it's, it goes beyond being first. I mean, there's lots of first people around. The place, the, they've got a lot of other people who could have helped, but what did the Ruffners do? They, they were pioneers in industry. They created a salt industry here. The vision of Joseph created a salt industry here. Just think, in 1850, there were 50 salt factories on the Kanawha River, and they weren't little furnace operations. They were buildings as big as this. This is a little exaggeration, but they were large furnaces, 50 of them. And of course, in the 1850s, that's when the salt business starts going bad. They were the first drillers. This is the first place that you had deep well drilling. The the the, uh, uh, the Morris jars drill bit still used today, but the procedures and the processes and even some of the tools that the Ruffner developed in their processes are used today for drilling. Whenever the, the, they wanted, when Drake wanted to open the Pennsylvania oil fields, he came down and got two Ruffner drillers in 1858, 59, right before the Civil War. And they're the ones who drilled the first oil well in America because everybody knew that the Ruffner drillers were the best. Okay, drilling. The coal industry. We already talked about uh, the innovation. Every time they, they lit a fire, they were thinking about how they could use less fuel, do it more efficiently, how they could barrel it up, what they could do. So innovation, and, 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 and I said Professor Steely has that book on the, uh, the antebellum trust industry. He also has written a book on the antebellum salt industry, and it is remarkable. You've got to read it. It's a fascinating read. It has a chapter on slavery that's just knocking your socks off. He is a uh, I mean, he, he went into the courthouse records where there was a lawsuit that people would talk about things, and he would figure out what people, uh, the, the uh, amounts that were paid for slaves, uh, what, what was expected, the leases of, of slaves from Virginia into the coal industry, and so on. Uh, they also understood worker relations. They paid by the barrel. You got paid by the work you did. Uh, equal pay. They used integrated housing. Whites and blacks lived together uh, in Malden. Pinkersville, which is where the Campbell's Creek Sockelite is, and they, they understood that the, nece the necessity for building a community to feed the production. That's the old coal, 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 coal baron concept, where they live, and in Malden, the, like the Dickinsons, the Rutgers, they lived next door to their salt works. It wasn't like you lived in Charleston in a fine house, and then you had a factory somewhere out of town. That wasn't the way they set it up. They lived where they, and of course, David moves out to Malden close to the salt spring. Oh, I didn't tell you. Remember that rider in the D with the Dickinsons? The Dickinsons remembered it too. <laughs> but David thought, well, I can. I can. Uh, George Alderson, George's Creek, George Alderson, George Alderson owned the track that is basically Old Mullen today. In other words, from. Uh, and Old Malden is right there, you know, where the strip is that you come in with from the Dickinson farm east. And I, 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 I understand from the Dickinson family that Richard Putney owned and had a salt works there before the Dickinsons, by the way. But the Dickinsons don't buy that property until 1840, so they're fairly, fairly late coming to the, to the party in Old Malden. David buys the George Alderson track, which is right adjacent to the 502 acres. So where does he put his salt works? on the Alderson track, just a few feet away from the Dickinson track. Did it work? Well, no, they litigated it from here till the cows came home, of course. And, and David ends up paying it off in some way. Uh, and of course, they're making big money by then. But what it does do, <clears throat> as you remember, I told you all, all, all the sons got, except for one, Samuel, who, who was very needy and had to be taken care of by the rest of the family. But the, 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 the sons, jointly owned that property. Well, David starts buying them out. But there's a complication, of course, because Abraham, who was the youngest by you know, 20 years of David, uh, uh, there's uh, 12 years difference between David and Daniel, who's here. So Daniel would have been at home younger than David. But David starts buying them out, but some of the other brothers sell to Andrew Donnelly. And Andrew Donnelly sues for rights. And the Dickinson heirs sue. So, I mean, 
David, and in fact, David, who is a David Ruffner, is a justice of the peace from 1797 for 50 some years until he dies. In Virginia, age 23 or 24, he is made a justice of the peace. Not bad. And then he moves here, and he was named a justice of the peace, serves in the legislature three or four terms, and then serves as a justice of the peace for the rest of his life, and he dies in 1843. So he's, 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 he's a big deal. But uh, going back to, the, uh, to their list, they also pioneered, and, 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 and you know, so it's like they, they made out of town. They created Malden. It's called Saltwater. He and, and, and uh, uh, Dr. Putney are the ones that laid it out. It's different. I had some, when I moved out there, somebody said, I just don't understand. There's something different down there. It's just different. Well, it's on a New England subdivision plan where there are alleys in the back. The houses are federalist to the front. In the back, you've got, this, you've got slave quarters. You've got chickens. You've got, you know, all, you know, whatever it might be that you need in order to survive So uh, uh, in those days. And, and it is different. But that salt bar, that was laid out on George Alderson's uh, track that was next to the company. So town planning, sure, governors did that. And of course, they weren't forgetting about Charleston. Charleston was named for the Clendenin's father, Charles. They wanted the name of Charlestown, and they couldn't because there was already a Charlestown for Charles Washington up in, in the eastern panhandle. So the legislature wouldn't do that, so they named it Charleston. And uh, uh, it, it, the lots sell very slowly. It just isn't happening until, of course, salt takes off. Then it's boom, this is a boom town. Education and schools, I cannot say enough about the pioneering uh, uh, of the Ruffner family. They are certainly in the state of Virginia, the most, when I say Virginia, I mean old Virginia and new Virginia, the most remarkable and important uh, educators that, that, that were there. Uh, David Ruffner uh, created the first school here called Mercer Academy. It was down, I think it's on the was on the property where First Presby is. He gave them the land, but then didn't do a deed. And about, <laughs> about 10 years later, they were real, all the Shrewsbury's never paid attention to deeds. But anyway, he later gives a deed to the, to the, uh, to the, church, to the church and the academy. In, the, in Mercer Academy School, the first Presbyterian church service was held here. And David Ruffner was baptized in that first service by his son, Henry. Well, now, what had Henry been doing? We got that breakfast table. We got Henry. Okay, Henry's the oldest son, born in 1790. So he's a teenager when they're digging, digging down. He is brilliant, and it's pretty obvious. And his, his dad went to school. Two-thirds of the time was in German, one-third in English. But he, he wasn't spoken English, was taught by a German, so he had to learn from the store, the store owner how to speak English. Henry Ruffner goes to school in Lewisburg, and I had the privilege of speaking with the good Methodist up here. Uh, he goes to Lewisburg to school with uh, Reverend McElhinney. McElhinney in Lewisburg had a, a school for Presbyterian ministers. And uh, what was that called? Does anybody remember the academy? Lewisburg Academy. Lewisburg Academy. All right. Well, Henry doesn't just go to school with all the boys. He lives with Reverend McElhinney. You say, well, it's because he was probably rich. Well, it's not that, you know, the Reverend, the Reverend said, don't take off with the money until in the War of 1812. So when Henry was there, he was there on his own merit. And uh, maybe everybody lived with, with the Reverend, but I, I doubt that. Henry Ruffner uh, learned Greek and Latin. He, and it's pointed out today too, that he is, did not become the minister, actual minister of First Presby. Uh, what, okay, what happened is David, they had, a, they had a service and created two churches, one for Charleston, which is First Presby and Canal Presbyterian. That, those, are, that, those are the two branches in town. And then the Canal Salings, famous Canal Salings Church in Mullet which David Ruffner, that was his pride and joy, he built in 1840, and he, he apparently went out of town for a few days, and they had put a course of brick up, and he made him take it down, because he was going to make sure every single brick was put in there under his supervision. So, and, and they took it down, and they put it back up. Uh, but anyway, so Henry was, was an ordained minister. He could conduct the service, but he never really is the formal minister of the church. What's he do? He goes off to Washington College, and, and, and it was Liberty Academy, it's not much of a college. It's got four or five professors, perhaps, and I don't know, a handful of, uh, of students. Uh, and it's really an academy. We were probably at the level of a high school for that. He goes there and teaches Greek and Latin. Now, you know he speaks German and English, so the, the foreign languages are kind of a natural form. In 1828, of course, he comes up with the way to fix the, the coal slide. Uh, and they, 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 he goes there, and he's back and forth. 
and then he uh, becomes president of Washington College. Now, today we know it as Washington Lee University. And, uh, and I just read something recently that, uh, that, that and remind me, Robert E. Lee was a great supporter of his son who, who uh, develops the first public education system in Virginia. But anyway, back to Henry. So Henry becomes president in 18, oh, I can't remember, 1835, I think, becomes president after being there a while and him refusing it several times. He's sort of a difficult personality. And I think David, I, I was going to tell you that David actually has to, he's justice of the peace, has to go to jail for a while because he, in one of those lawsuits down at the courthouse, he, he strikes with an anvil the manservant of Andrew Donnelly. So you know, he goes away for a little while in jail. But he's that is just the peace. I'm sure it wasn't a hard time for him. But so Henry becomes president of, of, and elevates that school to, to true higher education first class status. He increases the number. He gives speeches around the country. He's a, he's a well known educator. Uh, he commits the ultimate sin in the Old South, as everybody knows, in 1847 he wrote a pamphlet, the Ruffner Pamphlet, which was a sensation throughout the country. It was read throughout the United States. What he said in that pamphlet is, first of all, important for us, he addressed it to the citizens of West Virginia, coining a word that's later used, as we know. West Virginia. That's a Western Virginia. West Virginia. Now, who's he talking about? He's not talking about us. Alone. He's talking about everybody from the mountain where Charlottesville is, the Valley of Virginia, if you will, west to the Ohio River. And he says, look, we don't have that much slavery. What slavery we've got is a curse. And he doesn't approach it. He says, I'm not an abolitionist. I am not. An abolitionist believes it's a sin against God. I don't believe that it's a sin against God. I think it's the natural way of life. But it's a curse on our economy. So it's a pure track on the economy of, of slavery. He says, in eastern Virginia, we're just producing slaves now to send south. To the, uh, you know, they're, they're not productive. They're, not, they're actually more costly to keep than, to, than to, so on. So what we should do is, is divide the state into a slave region in the east and a non-slave region in the west. Well, it was a, it was a debate at, at, at the college. They had debating society. And he, he took up the, the cause of the abolition of slavery for the west. And then somebody was opposed to it. It was a fellow named Blackford. Who, who supported Ruffner and even gave him money to have the fact published, who in 1860 or 61 runs for governor of Virginia and they use it against him. They say, oh, you're one of those Ruffner pamphlet people. And the Ruffner pamphlet becomes the most important political issue in the, the election for governor. And this is the governor, of course, who's going to sit on the, uh, make the decisions about the secession of, of the state. So uh, the Ruffner pamphlet goes around the country. Dr. Ruffner had some problems with people locally anyway. You just get a feeling that he probably was professorial, he was brilliant, and probably didn't have a lot of time for some of the niceties of life. That's a cinch you get. But anyway, he leaves in 1848, I believe. Pretty soon after the pamphlet is published. It's, it's absolutely condemned in, in the South. In the North, they think, oh, well, in the North, you can see abolitionism becoming more and more. Prevalent, although it, it starts out as a very radical uh, concept, and certainly in this area. So, so Henry Ruffner, in 1841, proposes to do what Thomas Jefferson had talked about some time ago in Virginia, and that was to uh, uh, set up a system of public schools for every child. Well, how do you think that went over in eastern Virginia? The folks with the money. They believed absolutely that only the wealthy should have an education. And when Thomas Jefferson proposed such, they said we ought to set up a, a university. So we'll set up the University of Virginia so our kids can go get a good education. The rest of them, we're not going to do it. It was absolutely opposed. It was one of the basis of, of West, this part of West Virginia, wanting to, uh, having problems with old Virginia. That was a key one because the folks here were pioneers. They wanted education and wanted public schools. Uh, we put it in our constitution. We are the first southern, southern state to have a, a public school system. Uh, but So Henry, in, in 1841, proposes all these education reforms, including the establishment of, of, a, of, a, of a whole series of colleges around the state. 
their academies, their places people would go and they learn to read and write, but they really weren't colleges with, with, with higher education. Proposes that, proposes a public school education system, and do they do it? Well, no, of course not. But interestingly, in the um, he has a son named William Henry Ruffner. William Henry Ruffner is uh, was called the horseman of the South. He is. He never lived here. We have. We claim him as a favorite son, but he, he did not live in West Virginia or in, this, in the Canal Salines, as he would say. He was educated. He was a Presbyterian minister. He was really his father's son, in most all ways. His father was always a Unionist. When the war, and he's a Unionist. And uh, I read this one track about the Ruffner pamphlet. Let me just say that the Ruffner pamphlet was designed to change the people's attitude and keep slavery out of any growth into the Valley of Virginia or Western Virginia. But that was the purpose of it. And as this one commentator says, if it had succeeded, just think how the Civil War would have been different. Virginia would not have succeeded. There would have been a Civil War that would have lasted a few weeks or a few months because it took Virginia to make the Civil War a real war. And partially because of the leadership that was provided by Virginia, not just the resources, but the leadership of, of Stonewall Jackson. He lived in Lexington. He was a neighbor of, of Dr. Henry Ruffner, the president. Uh, if you had taken him out of the war early, and of course if Robert E. Lee had not gone over, we don't have a civil war. You say, well, do we still have slavery? I don't know. We won't go there. But this fellow made that, that, that had he been successful in convincing that part of Virginia to not. But what his son did was what everybody else did. He was a unionist until Fort Sumter and Lincoln but sent the call for 50,000 troops to go into the South to take care of business. And uh, he switches to a Confederate. Jo joins the Confederate Army, actually. His son does, William Henry, who has a throat problem. Had to stop preaching at a major church in Philadelphia where he was because he had a throat problem. And he's, and he's not ever been in great health. So he goes to start, and he's out the first time he can get out. He's not really going to care about when the, when the North wins, they require all of the southern states to establish public school systems. Virginia had 30 days to do it. So they go to William Henry and they say, you got 30 days to give us a, a, a public school system in the state of Virginia. It takes him three weeks, not 30 days. In the first year that William Henry Ruffner is the superintendent of public schools, he has 130,000 students in 2,900 schools. You say white schools, uh-uh. He absolutely relentlessly fought for black schools to be equal in Virginia. Were they? Well, you, know, you had a broken economy, you had a broken spirit, you had people who were angry, who, who, who had lost much of the value that they thought they had in, in slaves. So he had a lot of opposition, but he was relentless. He was there for 12 years, and then they got rid of him. But in that amount of time, he became a national figure and is known as the poorest man of the South because he, he was the first in any of the Confederate states to set up a public school system. He did it quickly, he did it efficiently, he traveled, somebody calculated that he traveled something like, it just can't be, 5,000 miles a year uh, on a horse to go around the state. He was everywhere. He apparently, I haven't tracked this down in Hampton, apparently was a speaker twice at Hampton Institute where Booker T was, when Booker T was there, because he would have been the superintendent of uh, schools. Okay, so Virginia Tech, to honor William Henry Ruffner, Virginia Tech's most, uh, their highest service award is the William Henry Ruffner Medal. So if you, your great service to Virginia Tech, you would receive the Henry Ruffner, William Henry Ruffner Medal. So in terms of education, I don't think you can, I don't think you can top the Ruffners. Uh, he basically did what his father had proposed in 1841. Uh, he set up, helped, was set up Longwood College, and the, the main building there was named Henry Ruffner Building. It burned, and I think it's been restored. What about government? Well, David was a magistrate, was elected to the General Assembly in Virginia. Lewis, uh, his son, who he turned the industry over to, his business over to in 1823, I think. Uh, Lewis was in the legislature for a while. And then, uh, uh, so we've got town planning, we've got government. Oh, they helped create a state. Lewis Ruffner is our delegate to the state convention to create the state of West Virginia. Not bad. Uh, he only talks, though, to, to propose compensation for slave owners. Uh, 
that's about the only time he says anything that's, that's recorded. Uh, they, of course, do town planning. Uh, they are just the leading family in terms of government and, and establishing uh, what we have today. They were also militia. David Ruffner was the current, was always called Colonel Ruffner because he was the head of the local militia. Uh, the, uh, in terms of, of their socioeconomics, uh, certainly the, the David, uh, Henry Ruffner's pamphlet uh, on the economics of slavery is a remarkable piece, and he was right, by the way, if, if, if slavery was, was an institution that was, would, someday would have come to an end. Uh, the, uh, well, that, that's big I, they took the Civil War, and that's what the war was about. I, know, I think it's uh, Professor Conley says it was not about slavery, but I, I think he's dead wrong on that. Politics, the Ruffner pamphlet, uh, 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 social, in terms of social relations, David Ruffner always included blacks in his churches. He said, now his churches. He, and there's a phrase in the family, much of this, what I'm getting of the early Ruffners is from the Ruffner family. Apparently, it says that he would fence off areas, okay, <laughs> inside of a building, he would fence off areas for blacks. But he was always concerned about their, their religion and their, their, their well being. He, uh, when, what he did is he built a church in Malden on his property and let any religious group use it that wanted to. So he established not just the Presbyterian church, but churches in our area. Remember, you know, there was a great awakening, I, I think that's what it was called, where there was a religious revival in America, but around the turn of the century in 1800s, people weren't very interested in religion. Religion was the old Episcopal church that they didn't want to pay for, and they just assumed not have anything to do with it. It was also a difficulty that they had with uh, not with this uh, the, uh, they also had difficulty. A lot of them came here. Their families came here within a generation or two because of religious strife. So they, they religion was not real popular here. Uh, in the, the Old Canal State Church, everybody talks about the slave balcony. I mean, that's that's it was intentionally built uh, uh, to be that legal. Of course, the uh, we just talked about corporate form, business trust. Uh, is there anything? Can you think of anything that they forgot? I have trouble. I, I, I would be happy to be helped with that. The Ruffners did it all. You say, now wait a minute, we were talking about that breakfast table. We've got David, we've got Dr. Henry, ultimate Dr. Henry. We've got Anne, who married the doctor and laid out the town, and he was a very prominent physician, and he lived a long life, and, and was a part, had a store. You know, there was a murder in Malden. Uh, uh, after we became a town, we had a peace officer who was murdered on corner of, right now, it would be at the corner where the Stevens and Grass funeral home is, that corner. Uh, there was a shooting, and, and, and old uh, uh, Richard Putney was, was there. He was not shot, but uh, he was there at the time. Thank goodness. And then you've got Lewis. Well, Lewis. Lewis Ruffner is kind of, you know, he's seven years younger than Henry, certainly not the, the, the brain that Henry was, but he's very important because he establishes really worker relations. He's the one who sets up the integrated housing. He's the one who encourages the African Americans that become the African Zion Church in, 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 after the Civil War in 1852 to start meeting together as a religious community of believers. Uh, Lewis has the property, you know, David built the, his salt, salt works and his farm right there where the, the circle is in Malden. Do, do people know what I'm talking about, the yeah. circle? There's a, there's, a, there's a circle of houses that were built after World War II. And the effect is if you can go in your mind to the Campbell's Creek stoplight, to the mouth of Campbell's Creek and the Campbell's Creek stoplight, right there there's a flat area that goes up Campbell's Creek and around. That is the original 502 acres. Okay. And then the Alderson track brings the Ruffners on around and they have all the property up to where the Dickinson farm is. And of course they even have beyond that because the, Dr. Putney apparently owned where the Dickinson farm is. The house, the Ruffner home, Okay, they were here, and then when David, in 1830, they set up Saltboro, that's what they called the, the, the town name, set up Saltboro. They, uh, uh, they built their house, it was, it was a white frame house. There is a picture, I got so excited, I got on eBay and I found the first chapter about the magazine that discusses Malda about from Slate, <coughs> where it was first published as a serialized magazine piece. And it said in the thing that there's a picture of Booker in front of the Ruffner house. Well, I just about, I mean, I looked at the, I, I waited. <laughs> just, it's like, please. Well, it's a picture of Booker there, but he's standing next to a tree, and you see, 
I mean, there's, there's not a, a quarter of an inch, Charlie, of the house that you can see, except you can see that it's a white frame. And Marty Cole, who's a local historian, she's 90, uh, 91 years old, uh, she remembers the house. She said that it was a large white frame house. Oh, by the way, Lewis Harlan, when he talks about Booker T, people say, oh, he got to live in the rich people's house. Well, please understand the Ruffners were very practical, sensible people. They did not go into elegance. They didn't have big social occasions or so on. But they had a large house. It had a large library and a central hall. And you could sort of guess that it's, you know, like the way we built frame houses. <coughs> Lewis Harlan says <coughs> that it was up on a hill and overlooked this vast domain. Well, it's a little old gnaw. No, you know that them all there aren't, there aren't any hills unless you go up, up, up away from the river. So it sat on a knoll, and where it was is where uh, General Copenhaver lives. There's a, a nice brick home. It slightly elevates just the knoll, and, and you say, well, why was it there? It's the highest point on the river, and if you build on a river, you want the highest point on the river. And that's it. But it's just a knoll. So they live there. Lewis is there. His, his father gives the property, when he dies in 1843, he wills it to the two boys and, and gives some to the man and so on. But, but basically it's a division of the two boys give the property. And, uh, but, but Henry Ruffner, well, so Lewis has the business. It kind of gets tough, you know, they, they're not making money. Uh, uh, the Ruffners are always a major producer in different, and they would be in different groups. They'd be in this company, Hewitt and Company, and then they'd be here and there. In 1847, he goes to Louisville to be a salt agent and stays about 11 years. And thanks to the man who's right here, Gerald Ruffner, we he gave me a newspaper article that he found. Lewis Ruffner in 1849 attends and joins an emancipation society in Louisville. So he too has real problems with slavery. And when he comes back, he's encouraging to the to the to the folks. It's Lewis who has the church in Tinkersville Hall. Tinkersville is the African American worker housing area of the Ruffner property there at Canal of Campbell's Creek. And they had a church. He, on his land, built a church with, or had them build a church on his land with the legendary Reverend Rice. Well, Reverend Rice uh, uh, continues with uh, the, uh, uh, the church. Lewis helps them move, come from there to the middle of Malden in 1872, and they purchase a property. In the deed, it says, on the property is a small red brick church formerly used by the Methodists, because the Methodists had moved and they were building a new church. They sell it to the fellow next door. Now, so you know, Booker's church is next to the fast check in Malden, a little white frame church oh, yeah. right there, that, that <coughs> church. And they come there in 1872. Well, how did they get the company? This takes us to the most remarkable story in Booker T. history. That's a story not told. Booker's stepfather buys the property across, just across the way. Now there's a railroad track just across the way, a block away. In 1869, four years after he's a slave, pays $500, $100 a year. Now these are in the key years of Booker. They've been here a couple of years, but Booker's got to work, and, and when he writes enough from slavery, he really is not very happy having to work with his stepfather. He worked all the time, that's all he did. Couldn't read or write, just worked, worked, worked. Well, his stepfather and his and his family lived there in the middle of Malden and were such incredibly good citizens. So they were the hardest working people in town. They were clean, they were good people, they were smart, they were trustworthy. So three years later, they, they, the African American Church, it's called African American, the African Zion Church of Tinkersville, comes to Malden to write in the middle of town. And I always remind them, I had a couple of school groups come through this weekend. I remind them, I said, now you think going to church is sort of going for an hour or two, maybe you go to Sunday school and then go to church, All day. Yeah. you know? And then, you, and then you, you, you go to Bob Evans or something, have lunch, or go to Grandma's room, and they're all going like that. I said, uh-uh, that's not what happened. Sundays, you went all day, and your family brought two meals with them. Because that's where you got everything. You got the education, you got people come, politicians come in and speak, you got the word of the day, everything. All the sociability was through one Sunday. Think about it. Their, their houses are down at the Campbell Street Lot. They now have to come to think about what the blacks went through, what they had to do. They had to come to the middle of Mall. It had very little property, by the way. The church sits on the size of the property. And it's got like three feet all the way around it. 
that church building was not there when they bought it. They built that later. And apparently with help of Lewis Ruffner, who's, who lives until the 1880s. So the, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's just a remarkable story in that regard. And of course, you know, this nine-year-old boy, and we're not sure, nobody can figure out exactly when he went to live with Mrs. Ruffner. Well, <coughs> Lewis, you say, well, why did he leave Malden? Well, he married a Shrewsbury. Everybody, like we already said, marries a Shrewsbury. Uh, Elizabeth, her father is Joel Shrewsbury, the most prominent uh, Shrewsbury in, in town. Uh, his brother is Samuel, just to give you a little idea on the Shrewsbury family. The old stone house in Bell was built by Samuel Shrewsbury. He had married good old Colonel John Dickinson from Bath County's daughter. His brother married her sister. So they come here somewhere around 1800, 1810, somewhere. We're not sure about the age of the old stone house, but, but I'm sure it's there by 1810 for certain. So his daughter, Samuel, oh, Samuel's youngest daughter is Juliet Shrewsbury. Anybody know who she is? She and her husband, James Craig, built, built the Craig Patton House. Okay. Samuel was one of the first salt makers. He said, well, why was he here? Because his father-in-law didn't trust the Rutgers. He said, if they can make salt, I want you there. And we're going to be making money, too. And that's exactly what, what they did. So that's who Samuel, Samuel was. His younger brother is Joel. Joel marries a Dickinson girl in Bedford County and becomes partners with William, her brother, and another one named Pleasant, and who, who came here and then sort of got out of the business but wasn't taken out formally, and everything's informal, especially with the Shrewsbury, just informal, you know, on a handshake. They, uh, one of the great stories of Maul, and I'll digress in a second, is, is, is William Shrewsbury and Joel Shrewsbury. William's about 90 years old, and Joel is, is in his late 80s. And they end the partnership with a lawsuit because uh, the Dickinsons say, you don't deserve a full half of this. And, he, and Joel says, well, I, you know, come on. I, you know, I, for 40 years we've had this business, this salt business, and, and other interests, I, surely. And the Pleasant left. And they said, no, between us, you really get at best a third. Well, the court case was decided, and Joel got, I think he got four tenths, and, and, and William got six tenths of the business. But there was always hard feeling between uh, the, the old men, and they, they died. There's a story in the, the book that we have, that uh, Mr. Drennan wrote about the Canal Valley Bank, where and I can't repeat the full story, but was, William was on his deathbed, and supposedly someone came to him, or a minister came and said, "Well, you know, you need to get right with the Lord and get right with all mankind." And he, he says something to the effect that I'll get right with everybody other than Joel Shrewsbury and him, I will meet him, or something to that effect. <laughs> so, but I don't know. But anyway, those are stories. But. Um, and, and the, the Dickinson Farm is where William Dickinson lived. And it was a one-story house until the 1930s, and they, they put a second story on, saving, thank goodness, the foundations and the, the bricks. So what you have out there is a colonial building uh, uh, re completely rebuilt in the 1930s to, as a two-story home. The, uh, okay, going back to Lewis, like, why is he important? Well, he's, he's got real problems with slavery. And Lewis is a staunch unionist. You go, well, everybody here was either one or the other. Huh? This was a Confederate place, folks. There are six Ruffners in the Canal Rifle. Henry's other son, youngest son, David L., is the number two in command behind Colonel Patton of the Canal Rifle. His uncle's Lewis. So Lewis is up in Wheeling, forming a new state, and becomes the first, I, I want to say first, I don't see that word used. An early, if not the first, uh, adjutant general, only it's called major general, of the state, the new state militia. So he's an army officer in the Civil War. He's offered a federal commission as a, as a military guy. He refuses that. I think there's a reason. So he's there. His lands, all that property out there is in jeopardy. Confederates do not come back through in the last two or three years of the war. So he doesn't have his place burned to the ground. They're early in the war, they did that. You know, but later on, they realized that it's you burn ours, <laughs> they'll burn <laughs> yours, and we, 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 nobody wants that. So they stopped doing that part, but they did burn some houses in Eastern Panhandle. But so he, he, his life and his and his, everything he owns and has is in jeopardy to be a unionist. His whole family are Confederates in the Canal Rifle. Six brothers in the Canal Rifle. Henry, 
Now, Henry dies, by the way, in December of 1861, as the Civil War starts. I'm sure he's depressed. He probably realizes by then, of course, that um, his son William Henry is, is, has joined the Confederate Army. And he's here, by the way. He comes, he gives a lecture, national lecture at the University of Virginia on, oh, I, I love this, on proof of the existence of God through miracles. There's a, a seminar. I, I remember, anytime I took a philosophy or humanities class, they talk about in the 18th, you know, after Darwin, it just ripped the religious thinking apart. People were trying to justify God because they were saying, you know, how do you prove God? You don't know your senses, don't really tell you. So on, so they had this whole series of lectures at the University of Virginia in 1851 or so, after he had, had left uh, Washington and later leave. Uh, and, uh, and he gave that lecture, and I've got a copy of it. It's very interesting how he argues that God has to exist because of miracles. So, but anyway, he's a, he's a nationally known, known lecturer. He's got to have been, and he, and he establishes his own academy. It's called Orvis, Ovis Academy, whatever the Latin word for sheep is. I think. Ovis? Ovis. Mount Ovis. Mount Ovis. Mount Ovis Academy. He does that, and then he dies uh, uh, in uh, 1861. Uh, a, a very, a, apparently a bitter and, and, and sad man. Lewis, I told you he married a Shrewsbury. Well, where's Viola, Viola Knapp from Vermont come in? Well, she's a very nice lady, very prim, proper, very clean. Uh, she has a, a good education. When Henry's wife died, I'm sorry, when Henry's wife dies in 1843, the same year that his dad dies, by the way, he's having trouble. He's got kids. You've got to go to 12. Yeah. And you said, you say, oh come on, I'm, you got to, you got to get in the mindset back there. There were standards and things you did and things you didn't do. Well, trust me, you didn't marry eleven months after the death of your wife. You go, well, but you could. Have. Well, the Shrewsburys never accepted Bob. By the way, his his Shrewsbury children did not accept this Bible. And the book writes about that. And William Henry, who does a history of the family, writes about how sad she is. And the book is really one of these bright lights in her life. Well, of course, they go off to Louisville. Uh, she is buried in Louisville. I, uh, Louisville is uh, important here because that's where a lot of salt was sold. Where Cincinnati's there, too. But Louisville was really the, 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 the key business place. The Craigs moved to Louisville, you know, leave St. John's Church and moved to Louisville. Built Kanawha, the same house that they built here. They built there. It's gone. Ours is still here, thank goodness. Uh, so, so Henry, I mean, I'm sorry, Lewis is there. Uh, and of course, he comes back here, but he's a salt agent for one of the companies. That's what he does while he's there. While he's there, he joins that Emancipation Society. Uh, Lewis stays out of politics. He's in the Virginia Assembly a number of years. You're elected for one year at a time, by the way. I mean, you get very little expense. You go Daniel Boone, spent a year, had an election, spent a year over there, and came back and hated it. Uh, so, so Lewis, Lewis is the big guy in town. He's a unionist. But he also wants to help blacks. Now, I think that the Mennonite thread in this family is very important. Say, wow. Well, we got the breakfast table. Remember, nobody talks about mom. Mom's father's a German immigrant, a Mennonite minister. They were strict people, you know, uh, uh, and years ago they dressed, you know, they were separate, something like the Pennsylvania Dutch, uh, the Amish, I mean. And, and uh, I think that she had an influence on her two boys to be questioned about the slavery. Now they came in the will from, remember Joseph willed three Negroes to his wife, to his widow, to live here at Holly Grove, well, what later became Holly Grove. Uh, he, uh, uh, so they had slaves. Peter probably had slaves. Joseph we know did because he, he has three listed, you say three? Right, they, and someone we were talking with as we came in. Slavery was very unimportant in this area until the salt industry builds up and gets built on the labor of enslaved people. About 3,000, by the 1850s, we've got about 3,000 enslaved people here. Uh, about 1,500 are owned by the folks here. Uh, Dick, well, uh, Dickinson Shrewsbury had several hundred in their operation. And the other half were leased from Virginia, which is how Booker's stepfather gets here. He's leased here as a, as, as a slave, escapes during the war from Lynchburg, and comes back here, which is a slave area, you know, because the, with the Emancipation Proclamation, we did not abolish slavery in, in West Virginia. West Virginia becomes a slave state. 
We all know that, right? <laughs> I, had to come out. I went back and looked at it again. I didn't really. That's the William M. and all the things going on and on about that. We, we had to provide, Lincoln required them to provide for the gradual elimination of slavery here. So that was the book. But anyway, so Lewis, you know, I think that that connection is different for them. They never, not David, not any, not either of the two boys ever went in uniform. Even General Robert, you know, when he was offered a commission, fell on him, didn't take it. I think that Mennonite connection is really important for the morality of who the Ruffners were. Uh, uh, makes them somewhat separate, uh, makes them uh, thinkers, and uh, I think made them unionists and anti-slavery. Uh, you know, they weren't abolitionists, they weren't saying they didn't know, but for their day, they were certainly way out there on slavery, and they deserve credit for that. So the sociability that we have today is it an accident that Booker T. Washington becomes a great world leader? No. No. Not an accident at all. Where was he? He was in the most important family in the Canal Valley, in their house, with Miss Viola and Lewis. What does he see? He sees Lewis Ruffner get a brain injury, not cold, get a brain injury when he tries to, to break up these night riders who are, who are having a, a, a fuss. Uh, according to Booker, it was 100. 100 uh, Knight Rider KKK folks versus blacks and 100 blacks and their supporters. I'm not sure that's in up in slavery, but I, I don't think that's exactly what happened. But anyway, he saw Lewis Ruffner get, get in the back of the head with a brick and get a brain injury from which he never recovered. He had to give his businesses over to his kids to manage because he just couldn't do it. He, goes, he lives another 10 or 12 years. Uh, I think I wrote that one down for easy, quick memory. I want to say 1830, 1883. Uh, when I was writing down births and deaths of these folks, by the way, the Ruffners lived a long time. Uh, Joseph, who, who died uh, in his early 60s, he was 63, is about the youngest of the bunch, and the women lived as long as the men. It's really remarkable to see that. Henry, Henry lived to be 71. Ann Ruffner lived to be 59. There was another Susan who married Moses Fuqua, which is a name that pops up. I think, what an interesting name. Well, one of David's daughters marries Moses Fuqua, and they make us all here and then move. And then Lewis. Lewis is 78, and he dies November 10, 1883. Uh, first European baby born at Fort Lee. Now, we like to say, in the, I used to say in the Canal Valley, but we've got folks saying, I oh, wouldn't say no, but you probably have a, a European baby born there before or General, uh, before uh, Lewis Ruffner. We call him General because he was a major general of the state militia. If you ever got a title of a military title, you kept it. It was Colonel Ruffner. And, uh, and Dr. Henry, how did he get his title? It was, it's an honorary degree uh, granted in 1838 by Princeton University. And at their largest seminar, at their largest graduation ever, there's a newspaper article provided again by Mr. Ratliff that says that they had 75 graduates at Princeton, the largest class they ever had. They granted about six honorary degrees. Remember, there's nothing like a PhD until Johns Hopkins uh, starts in the, after the Civil War, starts a special education program and gives a degree of PhD, and that's where now our doctorates now come from. But at this time, if any school would, get, would bestow a doctorate upon you, that was your title. And of course, people were happy when they, Harvard bestowed the title on, on Dr. Washington. So they had something to call him. <laughs> they didn't want to call him Mr. They didn't want to call him President. So that's how that happened. Now, so Lewis Ruffner is an absolutely remarkable man. He jeopardized, he has his, his life and his family and his property in jeopardy in the Civil War. He's, there's nobody in his family that's really supportive of his position as he is. Uh, he's a delegate and a state maker. Uh, and let's see. And of course, I think the kind of race relations, and, and I, my topic a lot of times is on Booker T and the race relations in Malta, is uh, um, I think is a legacy of the Ruffner family. I, I just think because Booker got, and what, the, what this brochure does that nobody's ever done before in terms of Booker's history is that this, it postulates that Booker's life here developed the career plan that he had for the rest of his life and from which he never, ever wavered. He said, it's simple, folks. 
we have to work. We, four million freedmen after the Civil War walking around with no masters, who read, no jobs, no home, no help. Booker saw 14 year old boys walking, African American boys walking around their house naked. I mean, I mean, he found, you know, the, the degradation of slavery on African Americans is, is just, it's just so remarkable. It, it, you just get, I mean, there weren't families that not only did not have a history or names, I mean, it's just incredible. Of course, Booker and, and Du Bois, you'll see Du Bois' baby picture on page three of the brochure. Uh, he was born free, black, very educated, uh, well-placed. I don't know if well-to-do is the right word, but uh, and Booker really believed in his heart that, that Du Bois never could figure out what was going on with Southern blacks because he never experienced it. And that the up from slavery thing is it's interesting piece, but I think Booker really believed that it's from my roots as to why my success, why I have the success I've had. Well, those roots are his word that he was worthy. Lewis Rucker, he said, well, wouldn't he have said so, Larry? No, but Booker didn't write uh, historic accounts. Booker wrote for a purpose of showing that, look, what I've gone through, you can go through, you can go through, don't live for Saturday night, save your money, do it for your children and their children, and someday we will be a part of this country. And Booker kept emphasizing how much we love. He says, it didn't happen. He says, we are unique as a people because we love this country. And we love the white people that we live with. We are unlike the Native Americans who went to war with us. We, we folded into the American culture. And what do we do with four million folks in the South that have nothing? His theory was work hard, be clean. He always, every time he talked, he talked to the kids, he talked about toothbrush and why it was important to talk. Always his toothbrush story. And you do it not for yourself, but for future generations. Once we become a, a valid economic part of this country, we will get the political and social rights that we deserve. <clears throat> you go, we, and it took seven generations or more for us to get the South to come around. Booker thought it was going to happen a lot quicker. It's true. Booker dies at age 59. Uh, had he lived like uh, Professor Du Bois to be 95 years old, um, or Leon Sutherland to live into his 80s, he would have, Booker would have been up to the to World War II. He would have gone up to the Korean War. Almost. Tell me that Booker wouldn't have had a different imprint on American society. But he didn't get to. He's really a, the Andrew Carnegie of education. And he gets sealed in the Gilded Age. His icon of history is sealed in the Golden Age. Uh, we, we really, I don't know where you all were, but on, in November of 2008, it was election night. And I can remember, I was sitting on the couch, and John McCain, gracious speech, says, a hundred years ago, an African American named Booker T. Washington have dinner with the President of the United States in the White House. It created an international sensation. Tonight we have a black and African American President of the United States. Now, <clears throat> that's something I never thought I would see in my and I'm not talking politics. I never ever thought I would see that in my life. I was in we had friends in Belgium who would visit and they said, Obama can't win. I said, no, he can't. I said, it's lining up. Watch it. And they said, oh, and they, they, they liked the, 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 uh, uh, the Clintons very much. And they were very much for I said, no, watch it. Don't. This was in the, right after the, uh, the uh, Iowa primaries. And, uh, and they said, I had people would come over. We met everybody in the town. And they would come over and say, there's no way. What are you all doing? You know, there's no way that America will ever want to be a president. And that eliminated the footnote that we have always lived with to the American dream. You can grow up to be president of the United States. I was told that. I don't think you all, I don't know that women were told that, but certainly boys were. You can be president of the United States. And it was a part of the American dream. That footnote of race, unless you're an African American, is gone. I contend that it, I think it's a legacy of Booker, but it's also a legacy of his heroes. We got Lewis, his Reverend Rice, who, who was a slave himself, set up the church, uh, organized the first school in town, uh, got the got the African American the Figuersville Church up to the mall. He baptized Booker at age 14. Uh, did not marry Booker. Now, in your in your handout, 
you'll see that I circled the word, it is likely that Booker was married in the Kanawha Salines Presbyterian Church. No question he would have attended with Miss Viola, and he would have probably been asked to sit in the balcony. He wasn't a slave, but he would have been asked to sit in the balcony because when he was there with her. We don't know how, when exactly he was there with her. It was, it was a number of years. She wrote to him and said, Booker, can you remember when you came to live with me? She told one person it was in 1866, which would have been within the first six months of his being there, and it could have been, because he kept coming and going with her. He, he, he made, I'm trying to remember how much he made, it wasn't very much, uh, maybe six dollars a month or something, but that would be his one third of that hundred folks that they needed to cover the mortgage with. His brother John also worked very hard. But Booker, well, we're not sure how long or when he was there. Uh, uh, she certainly was Booker's hero. He gives her credit, but again, it's because he's telling a story. And the story is work hard, be clean, uh, work with your hands, it's honorable work. Remember that in the South, the culture of the South, to work was degrading. No white person worked. He talks about at the plantation when he was growing up, that the males didn't do anything, that they looked to blacks to do work. And he had to convince those four million freedmen that work is not only honorable, but it's, but it, it's, it's good, it's healthy, it's what you want to do, it's how you're going to become a full partner in American life. So he had to reverse the thinking of blacks that work was de degrading because they were the ones that had to do it, not the white men that sat on the front porch. So Booker's heroes would be Lewis, Miss Viola, certainly Reverend Rice, uh, the James family, C.H. James, everybody knows he was a major wholesaler and the family became very wealthy at the turn of the century uh, and, 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 and continued to be in, in major business people in, in Texas now. Uh, the, the father of C.H. James was the, was the first minister called to the African Zion Baptist Church. He's there a little while, he then comes into town, forms another church uh, across the river, and then forms First Baptist of Charleston. It's First Baptist of Charleston, not West Virginia, because the African Zion Church is the First Baptist Church in West Virginia. So he had, he had, he had an opportunity to see people who were pioneers, who, who, who were different from other people, who were willing to take the criticism of their approach, who, who could be unionists in families of Confederates, could be unionists in towns of Confederates, uh, could uh, uh, withstand you know, what other people thought of them, could write pamphlets about the abolition of slavery, could join an Emancipation Society in Louisville, when nobody else was doing that, and certainly not other members of their family. And Booker's in the middle of it. That's where he gets his plan. And it's, it's, a, it's a plan that worked, uh, but it didn't work quick enough took much too long. You say, well, why? Well, if you want to speculate with me for a little bit, remember World War I and World War II. If there's anything we learn about those two wars, it's that if you destroy a country and don't help them rebuild, you will get a country that does rebuild in a way that you don't want. And that's exactly what happened after World War I. Well, what happened in the South? The only person that could have changed the, the economic history of the South was Abraham Lincoln. Uh, you know, the, the malice toward none. I, you know, if you want to guess, I think Lincoln would have, would have provided reparations to the South, reparations wrong, would have provided help to the South, whether it would be actual compensation of owners for slaves or a rebuilding of the Southern industry or whatever, I'm not sure, but it clearly would not have been sort of the, the, the put the troops down there and show them who's boss sort of approach that was done during the Johnson years not with Johnson's support necessarily, they try to impeach him, or they do impeach him, but they don't get him convicted by one vote, I think, of what West Virginia said. But uh, a, a different sort of story. The South had the South not, because by the, by the time of the turn of the century, Booker, the, the lost glory of lost slave times had gotten so permeated in the Southern mystique that poor people wanted to go back. It, the, slavery didn't help poor whites at all. But they were the ones who took up the cause, uh, uh, not for slavery necessarily, but for their state. They fought the, the war, and, uh, and, and they afterwards believed that they too lost something by losing slaves. Well, if that story hadn't been there, probably while Booker was there, we would have gotten that, that economy to, to respond much quicker. No, that's my thought. Uh, compensation for slaves, Lewis Ruffner argues for that at the convention, because he says that's what's necessary. You say, oh, he just 
rich guy trying to get some money from a political position. Well, look, you can make that argument, but uh, I think he also had a vision, as the Ruffners tended to have, of what's going to happen if you don't. And, uh, let's see, any questions? All right, now, so let me summarize a little bit. They were pioneers of industry. They created the salt industry, one of the largest and most important industries in America. This was not a little, little industry. It was the most uh, famous part of Virginia. The drillers, they invented modern drilling, drilling tools, techniques. Uh, Billy Morris, of course, invented the jars, drilling bits that's still used today. Uh, they were the drillers that were brought from Pennsylvania to, taken to Pennsylvania to drill the first oil well there. Uh, I'm always reminded when I give this talk, and I say the first, well, they, the Ruffner drillers drilled the first oil well in America, and the folks from Burning Springs and uh, around Elizabeth, West Virginia, say, wrong. <laughs> we, we drilled before they did. And that's, that's where I'll take that. I think that's a good. So anyway, they started the, the Pennsylvania and generally the American petroleum industry. Uh, you say, well, what about natural gas, Larry? Well, the Ruffners really weren't in on that. It was owned by George Washington and Andrew Lewis. It was Burning Spring. It was a phenomenon. It was the most, someone wrote that it was the most famous piece of real estate in, maybe in America. I mean, people knew about this, this fire spring that just got all of a sudden would take off and burn for days and days. Uh, the, uh, and then it was owned by uh, William Tompkins. And William Tompkins' wife, remember, was U.S. Grant's uh, aunt, the mother. She was the sister of his, of his father. And he, in 1841, took the, the gas from the Burning Spring and put it under his, he was at, du, it's at DuPont Middle School, and there's a monument to the world discovery of natural gas appropriately there. William Tompkins had his, had his salt works there. Now, William Tompkins, of course, built Holly Grove and Cedar Grove. No, he built, I'm sorry, Cedar Grove. Yeah, Cedar Grove and Cedar Grove. Anyway, uh, so then he had, uh, uh, he used it for the first time, Piped it in, and I think he may have started with wooden pipes. That's kind of frightening, but anyway, they start. They they made they got metal pipes, but he also used it to fire his furnace to light his furnaces at night. And I always tell school kids so the night shift was maybe invented at Dupont Middle School. Uh, I, I, probably not. There was other gas lights, but remember, gas before in the 1820s in Boston and other places was dirty. I mean, it was incredibly dirty. Natural gas is clean as that. Matter of fact, has no odor. There. So, uh, so really, the Ruffners, thats about the only one. I, but and you say, well, yeah, but they established this, they established the salt industry, and uh, I candidly don't know how to turn this on. <laughs> My brother, who I love dearly, but I don't want. To. Okay. Uh, so uh, I give a constitution speech at Dupont Mill every year. I've done it for seven years, and I love doing it. But last time I. I we got a call from George Washington. They, they loved it. I said, I know you're dead, but we can't, I can't talk to you right now. They, this, this is not part of the program. Uh, oh, finishing up on our list. We've got, uh, we've got, maybe you'll learn. Okay. Uh, I don't know how to turn it off. I'll get this Okay. Uh, education schools, nobody. There's nobody that can touch them on education. They built the schools. Uh, Dr. Henry Ruffner, just the most remarkable man, and then William Henry comes along and finishes the job. Government, you know, they're, they're all over that. They're magistrates, they're delegates to the state convention, state makers. Town planning, they established Malden and downtown Charleston. Um, they ran, they were the head of the militia, both the new state and, and the local Kanawha County militia, David Black. The socioeconomic uh, uh, affairs of, of, of Malden, where you had integrated housing and equal pay for equal work. Is just uh, you know what developed Leon Sullivan's principles. Uh, politics, of course, the Ruffner pamphlet, social, socioeconomics, um, just the, the understanding that Henry Ruffner had of that, and uh, and of course legal formation, the, the first business trusts and first uh, corporations with shareholders. Is there anything we left out? Shopping. Shipping. Shipping. Uh, well, they 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 shipped. I don't think. I mean. 
I do believe that they got into some steamboat industry, but they were not leaders. No. And the shipping, of course, was by barrels. Everybody uh, had cooper shops, and they sent it down the river on first on flat, flat boats and then on steamboats. Booker, I'm told by Nell Chelton that Booker worked in the Dickinson's cooper shop there at the Dickinson farm when he was when he was a child. Uh, now I, I pointed out that there's I've got a couple mysteries. But that's one is where did Booker get married? Lewis Harlan says that he was married in, in the African Zion Church. And he quote the footnote is to the, the, the county court records. Well, I went to the county courthouse and lo and behold, there's no location of where a marriage occurs in those old records. What you do have is the the groom's name and where they're born. He's listed as being born in, in Kanawha County, which is wrong. So somebody, maybe Booker didn't report this, by the way. Number two, the wife. She was at Fanny Norton Smith, who was from Malden, and he married her the year after he started at Tuskegee. He came back and married her. She was a childhood sweetheart in 1882. And uh, uh, the, uh, then it has the who married them, and the, one of the first elders of, first, uh, of, of, of uh, the First Baptist Church in Charleston is listed as the minister. And then the witness is Hubbard, who ended up buying, owning the He's a, an overseer for the Dickinsons before the war. He is he owns the Putney House. He and his wife own the Putney House, and he sells uh, the Putney House to the Presbyterian Church as a man. So it's just across the street. It's my belief that Booker was not married in the African Zion Church. Why? Because his his sister, at age 15, was married by Reverend Rice uh, to a man who was twice her age, by the way, and and. Uh, Benjamin Johnson. His her the father uh, has a second marriage. He's married by Reverend Wise. Booker's not. And I, I just I believe that Booker was married in the in the Canal Seventies Presbyterian Church. They don't have any record of it. The reason for it is is Mrs. Cooper, whose house I bought, she was an African American lady who at age eleven was she was eleven when Booker died and she knew Booker's uh, sister. Her mother was best friends with, with Amanda Johnson, his sister. And he would bring tinkets and toys to her when, when she was a little girl. She said, I was married in the in the Canal Salem's church next door. My parents were married in the Canal Salem. I said, really? And she said, well, our church was too small for a big wedding. Booker, I think, would have been a pretty big deal and probably had a pretty big wedding. But I'm going to change the word from likely married in the Canal Salem's church to possibly married. <laughs> I, just not, I just don't have enough to do it. I think Hubbard is the fellow who reported the wedding. My guess is that he would not have been in Charleston for the wedding, but maybe. But he, uh, uh, my belief is that is that it, that he was married in the Canal Salem's Church. There's there's something printed that he learned his catechism in the kitchen of the the, the minister of the Canal Salem's Church. So I, I think there's a lot of connections there to the Reverend Church. So that and then uh, you'll notice that there's a little blurb in there where I talk about Amanda. At first, I said they bought that big house in 1880, where the park is that West Virginia State maintains, was Amanda's home. Let me give you some dates. In 1875, she's about 15. We don't know 15. She says she's 18, but according to Harlan, she's she's probably would have been 15, 15, 18 in there because in slave times they didn't have her. She marries 1875. In 1880, John Washington and her husband, who's twice her age and a laborer, purchased three lots there in the middle of Malden. And it says lots, so I don't know if they built the house later or not. So I had to change it, and you'll see some, some whiteouts there. I had to change it because the, the wording sounded like they purchased the house that was there and fell down. And it's the fall down of that house that began the preservation of the Old Malden. Uh, so I had to make that change, and you'll wonder why those are some of those things. But uh, it's pretty remarkable. 1880, they got there in 1865, 15 years after they arrived in town as the most resourceful family in town. She's living on Main Street. Which family? Pretty good. Huh? Which family are you speaking of now? Oh, oh uh, Amanda, Booker's sister. Booker's sister. Okay. She's married in 1875, 15 to 18 years old. Five years later, with her brother's help, who was the, the John Washington, who's still living there and her husband purchased the property, those lots. At some point, they built a, a nice large house that would look much like the Hale House that's there now. Everybody know where Cabin Creek Quilts used to be? Yeah. Across the street. A house that looked like a big two-story brick, 
rooms out the back, you know, oh, yeah. chicken coops and all the stuff that would go in. So uh, they were just the most remarkable family, and it's their heroes that they saw in Old Mall. And the heroes really are the runners. And I think they deserve great credit. Yes, sir. Larry, what happened to the strong box, the uh, vault, we would call it, that was in the oaks? Okay. Uh, it's, I, uh, I, I, I want to say that they still have it. I'm, I, I'm not quite sure. I've talked with Mike Jarrett about that, and it was there. Uh, uh, I'm thinking that they still have it, but I, I don't know. I'd have to it, check it. it. But it was a wooden it safe. The original thought all about it back, right? It was their vault, yeah. their money vault. Yeah. That was the steamboat area, and there was a hotel there, and that was a commercial area where the Oaks House is. Yeah, yeah. that ought to be part of this museum. Yeah, perhaps. Anyhow, it's a very important piece. Yes, ma'am. Well, okay. Let me do a little simple. I know that John Hale wrote a lot that he got, I think, from Henry Rockman, probably wrote a lot about the actual production. So if you want to read very, in great detail. The concept was pretty simple. And I always say salt mines. No, we ne no salt mining here. This was a drilling process. Brought up the salt brine, and then they had to melt it off. And, and once they melted off the water, then they had the salt and put it in barrels that they made, put it on the river on flat boats, and the boat came down the river. Cincinnati was, is, is the queen city of, 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 of the West, and it's because it was built on canal salt. It was a port packing industry place, and it's the move to Chicago with cattle and railroads that end mold and salt. Oh. That's, that's what puts the death to us. Right, though. I mean, the entire you know, demand for the salt moved out of the Ohio Valley and over there, which set it up for the Michigan salt makers. The lake goes from here all the way up to Michigan, and, and, and the Dow, the, the, the folks who set up later, the, the ancestors of the, of the Dow Chemical Company were in for Michigan salt makers, always in competition, always in competition with the South. So if you'd like to go back to those days, you can say, well, the old Michigan guys got us and then they bought out uh, Union Carbide. Well, were they injecting water into the ground? What, the, it's a lake. It's a salt lake, a big, huge, salt lake. And it goes all the way from, from here in the Kanawha Valley all the way up to Michigan and around. And of course, you know, we know that with that, Hooray goes coal, natural gas, oil, and uh, in those products. But to answer your question, that was the innovation that they had to do. Nobody had done that kind of boil off process on a massive scale. And the innovations went on. There's a, a fellow named George Patrick, I think, who came with a special process. And I just I haven't dug into that very much, but, but it was a process that everybody started using. And it allowed them to make huge, vast, vast quantities of salt. And of course, then it lowered the price. You know, it's like, why don't we have a salt cartel to keep, to keep people from? And a lot of people were paid to not produce. They were given money just here, take your money and just stop. So that was part of it. But yeah, it was a process of boil. Now I need to tell you that I don't know where we are on our time. The uh, the Dickinson family is making salt again in Mulder, and it's magical in my mind. It was an article in the paper. They invited me out. I was just Delighted. They invite uh, uh, Lewis Payne and his sister, who is a chef, um, uh, Ms. Buns. Buns is her name. Sorry. But anyway, they invited me out, and they and I got to taste the salt. It is absolutely remarkable. It's big, chunky salt. It's it's a, it, what you might call a pinching salt or a sprinkling salt. It's not for cooking, because that it, it is spectacular. I mean, you sprinkle it on a tomato, and you're just in another world. It explodes in your mouth. I'm serious. It, it, you go, look, it's salt. I always thought salt, I mean, it just it kind of makes it, gives it a little flavor, right? This, this stuff it, it has its own, it is remarkable. They, they hope to be in production, I think, in October, but I don't know, I haven't seen it. Uh, but they gave me samples, and they've got to figure out packaging and all that sort of stuff. And you say, well, what kind, how are they going to manufacture salt? Well, it's an all-natural process. And I said, well, how do you heat it? And they go, we don't heat it. What they, and they said, we can't claim it's organic, because it's, they said it's a natural process. They went down 345 feet, drilled down, modern drilling techniques, you know, sunk a pipe and then got a pump, and then just this big white plastic uh, uh, reservoir. It's a good size, probably 10 feet around, uh, 10 feet across, and it's big. 
and they put the water in there, and then the, the, the water and the chemicals. The reason we have a chemical industry in West Virginia is not because of the salt. I thought it was the chlorine, but I'm not the chemist. My brother is the chemical engineer. It's the residue that comes out of the salt brine that creates the, that gives us the chemicals that create the, the, the salt and the chemical industry in oh, West Virginia. Wow. Yeah, and I said, well, wouldn't it be nice if this was reddish color? And they said, well, you don't really want it. And they showed me the red color. It's not, because it was famous for all the red salt. It's ugly. It looked around. Kind of, it was just the wrong color. <laughs> I said, I agree with you. The white salt's good. But what they do is that when it, once it's settled, then they spray the water into these drying pans. And they're nothing more than railroad ties with this huge, really thick, black plastic fabric on them. They pour it in there, and it's about that much deep. And it, they said in three weeks it dries and you got the salt. Yeah, and you said, well, that's just too easy. Well, but I, you know, it, uh, and, but it's delicious. And I really wish them luck. The idea was, I think, I think it was chef, the chef's idea to, to do this. And she, they apparently have some orders and, and chefs who are interested in it. But if you see it come out, you got to rush and get it. I told them that we're going to be able to get out our old salt cellars. Anybody got a salt cellar in the back of the cabinet? It's like, what do you do with that? You don't want it on the table because it'll ruin your silver. Well, they may be back. You know, these folks have, have a really special product. So we're making salt again and all that. And it basically was that process. Only they had to use a fuel source and it was massive. We've made three million barrels of salt in 18, 47, 48, somewhere in there is the peak. Remarkably, in the 1850s, the market just goes to nothing. And of course, it's railroads and, and, and changes in the economic system. And by 1860, the salt industry really is, is pretty, pretty much down. The number of producers is reduced. Then we have the flood right at the beginning of the Civil War. Apparently, in downtown Charleston, St. John's Church had six feet of water in it or something. The, the, the church, St. John's was at the where McF McFarland Street on Virginia, where the uh, parking garage is. And, but the flood came through and it absolutely destroyed most of the operations and they did not continue. Who's the last one? Good old John Q, John Q. Dickinson. Right? And his, his, his group, he was not the one, but it was his, his salt works was the last in law in, in 1945. But they, can, they had a bromide plant there. And so the last industry in Malden was in 18, I'm sorry, 1985, uh, was the, the, they closed the bromide plant. And, uh, so then, and then it was located on the Dickinson. Farm. Well, what connection did they have with the Evans Lead? They had some connection that they couldn't expand with the Evans Lead. Because they followed the operator there, or the friend that was there, the president of uh, Small Valley Bank at one time. Well, one of the things you discover, I, I've approached this two ways. One is the history of St. John's, and it's just fascinating because of the people who organized that church Joel from Shrewsbury and James Craig and different people. Uh, but it's pretty obvious real quick that everybody's marrying everybody else, that they're truly aristocratic, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and so the connections are everywhere. And everybody's related to everybody else. But they are all fierce business people. McFarland that owned the bank foreclosed on his wife's family. <laughs> I hear that they were business people. That's the other thing. I mean, just, I mean, these folks did business. John Hale who's quite a story unto himself, is sued by everybody, it looks like everybody who ever did business with him. I went through the courthouse records in the 1850s, I mean, he sued for $25 and $83 on you know, store accounts and everything else. And uh, Brooks McCabe, I should say, is, is doing a wonderful, it'll be an incredible history, of uh, four families in the Kanawha Valley who, who have had an economic impact. And, and it's interesting that he chose the James family because they were African American and very successful after the war. They're really, I mean, they were contemporaries of, of Booker. Booker saw what can be done if, if African Americans are just allowed to have their businesses and to do business themselves. And that, uh, the, the James family is really remarkable for that. Also, he's doing the Dickinsons, the bank, and so on. He's doing Benjamin Smith, which is Ike Smith's family, the Noyes and, and Smiths. And then he's doing John B. Hale, who had no family. John B. Hale uh, had no children, but he was the ultimate entrepreneur. And Brooks says what's nice about John P. is that that lets us go back to the beginning and first salt maker, which everybody says is Mary Ingalls, Draper, his great grandmother. And he's the great historian. He's really the most, I think, the most important figure in the Canal Valley in the, the 19th century. I, 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 don't think, I can't think of anybody else that would 
really mean that. He's the one, he invests his own money, he loses his money, he goes bankrupt all the time, but he just has this passion to do stuff for the community. He built, he gets investors, they build the state capitol. You say, well wait, before, yeah, before it was a state capitol. They build the building and then go to Wheeling and say, let's move to Charleston. They couldn't have come down here if you didn't have a building. They built the state capitol. I mean, Tokyo Hills is remarkable. Put the Brick Street in on Summer Street. You know, you say, well, would, would, would he be a hero of Booker? There's really no connection, but there certainly could be because he and Booker came from the same county. He came 20 years from <coughs> all in the 1830s, 20 years before Booker was born in 1856. So Franklin County is an interesting place. Bert Pillerman, West Virginia State Post. Bert Pillerman came from Franklin County, Virginia. And I read one thing, I didn't put it in the brochure, I'm afraid, but I want to, uh, is that um, Adam Clayton Powell came from Franklin County, Virginia to Kanawha County. And of course, it's his son, Adam Clayton Powell Jr., who goes up to that remarkable fellow named Neil Sullivan. Mom, he's a college basketball player at West Virginia State, teaches and has two churches, and says, Look, when you get your degree, when you get your degree, I want you to come to New York to my daddy's church, Abyssinia Baptist Church in Harlem, the largest, at one time had 10,000 members, the largest African American church in, in the country. And uh, uh, so, you know, there's so many people, so many African American leaders that come through the Kamal Valley. It's really remarkable. So, uh, if you think we've got too much on Booker T and Old Mullins history there, all I can say is that without that, you have no audience. Yeah. We are we are the only folks. We're the only ones that you know that's not true. There are people in the Canal Valley who care about our buildings and preservation of them. That's true. But uh, you guys are the ones where the, the rubber meets the road. Uh, the Booker T Washington story I think gives us international significance because, in part, because of Leon Solomon. He's exactly Booker has exactly the same plan. You know, work hard, be trained, get an education. You know, uh, uh, it, 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 you know, he leads the boycotts in Philadelphia and becomes famous, gets on the board of directors. Of, with, is the first African-American board of directors with General Motors, then the richest, most powerful kind of corporation in America. And gives an incidental speech, says, you know, we just get, we've got Southern, we've got modern slavery in South Africa. Why in the world do we not do, we do, do business with them? So he started and maintained the international, led the international boycott of South Africa. A remarkable thing. He was criticized, like Booker's criticized. He said, I've got a plan, 15 years. And people said, 15 years? That's a whole generation of young people that are going to be under this oppression. And he said, TTT, things take time. And it took 20 years. And in 20 years after his plan started, Nelson Mandela becomes president of wow. South Africa. Peacefully. No bloodshed, folks. Yes, sir. Larry, what caused you to land in Baltimore? Caused what? You. The land and mold. <laughs> How did I get there? James Tebow. The, the person who's responsible for preservation of, of, of all model buildings. James Tebow, social vista worker, and it's referred to in your brochure. He was a vista worker and came here in the 1970s and uh, early 70s and formed Cabin Creek Quilts over in Este. And then he came to Mall and said, this looks like home. This looks like New England. And, wow. and, and Amanda Johnson's house was fall down, there's a picture in there of what the house was like. And he and Jim Jeter, if anybody remembers the Jeter, Jim Jeter and Mr. Coleman, saved Putney House. And then uh, the Kanawha the, uh, Valley Historical and Preservation Society really began some of their work out there. So, so Malden was, was very important to that. James and I meet in, Ma in I'm sorry, in, in uh, Morgantown. And I drove through South Hills, I'm in South Charleston. Man, I, mean, I just it wasn't even like, he said, well, why don't you move on? I just, I thought it was a charming place, just like where I grew up in Peterstown, Monroe County. Just, there's no, in Peterstown, there's no, well, there may be a gas station now. But when I was growing up, there was one gas station and, uh, and, and one restaurant, you know, there's just a, a hardware store and that's it, and a grocery store. But uh, uh, James has, has really been a, a leading spirit for me and we're still friends. Uh, his wife was selected as the first uh, state social, the first state social worker of the year and not just she was the social worker of the year because she gets real modest and i said no wait, if you're the first social worker to ever be designated <laughs> that's pretty special of itself uh, she has the good living retirement homes in Mall, which is a wonderful place and she is a, a remarkable person so the, yeah james tebow and cabin creek quilts uh, uh, my wife was a vista worker at uh, uh, at cabin creek quilts and that's how we met so i, I sort of when I say the roughness, everything you see is the roughness. Everything you see would be in terms of Mullen is James Tebow. And he said, there's a house down here in the corner, and the lady's going to a nursing home. You ought to look at her. And there's many women to look African-American.
Samaritan woman, from, she knew Booker T. Washington as a child, she'll tell you stories, and so she, and she did. Uh, I asked her, we, I would go to the nursing home, she was at Dr. D. Hodges, and, and she, she was just, a, she was a second grade teacher, and she was very strict. She wouldn't say the, something about when the steam coats came in. She would say, oh, you could tell it was coming because the boys were running, you would say they would have those long coats, and they'd be flapping in the wind, and she was, so I was just magical lady. And she's the one who saved the African Zion Church, by the way. Her grandmother was enslaved and was one of the original organizers of that church. Uh, I mean, she really was remarkable. And I said, Mrs. Cooper, what, what were segregation days like? And I, I wasn't sure. She had really a lot, but she was very tall lady. And she's very elegant. You'll see her standing there on the Queen Mary as you see her picture. She was a, a grand lady, had a very small house, lived with uh, Mr. Cooper, who was a masseuse and, and, and a workout person at the YMCA downtown. She, she had on red, I, a red nail polish. She said, I have had a very romantic life. And she said, uh, she said we had friends in New York. She went to Will because she said, now, segregation was, was, was not good, but for me, it worked out pretty well because I went to West Virginia State and the Wilberforce. But then for graduate school, they paid for me to go to Columbia because I got free tuition because the state didn't have the only graduate programs were at WVU, and that was segregated. So I got to go to Columbia, and I got friends in New York City, and they would go away in the summer. So so Coop and I would always go up in August, and we'd stay in their apartments. She said, "I saw that." Now this is the answer to the question: What about segregation then? She says, "We went to New York." She said, "I saw the last game the Dodgers ever played." In, in, in Brooklyn. She said we had rooftop dancing. She had a gown. I mean, this lady dressed up. She was really a grand lady. And, uh, and she said it was just a romantic time. She said, now, Mr. Rowe, do you, do you know what, do you know the N-word? I said, yes, Ms. Cooper, I do. And she called me Mr. Rowe, by the way. She was very formal. And I said, yes, ma'am, I do. And, and she said, I never heard that in all of She said, I was always, always treated with respect in Mall. And I think that's the kind of relationships and the kind of foundation that Booker saw. And he, and he knew I could just get whites who have the money and the power to help us and encourage us with education. We can participate together and change this country. We can be a full partner. So is this the legacy? Is the election of Barack Obama the legacy of Booker T? Yes, because that's exactly Booker's pattern of what's going to happen. And if it had happened three or four generations earlier, he would have been the genius of genius. It just took longer than it should. Uh, when I say middle class, you see, what's unique for us is that we started building a black middle class in the 1800s. The South and Atlanta started building it in the 1950s and 60s. And what's the effect of that? We have produced more African American leaders than anywhere else in the country. And you say, well, who, Larry? Well, we've got Booker, obviously. Uh, we have the, the founder of, of Black History Week, Al Mont, uh, Carter G. Woodson, who was a dean at West Virginia State for a couple of years and elevated the, the, the education there. And then we've got uh, Tony Brown, the, the Tony Brown's Journal. Yes, we have Lewis Henry Gates. You say, now wait a minute, he's not Kanawha County. Well, he spent his summers here because his family's here. But uh, I, I say West Virginia, and I use it broadly because this is true all over the state. How did it happen? We paid school teachers the same whether they were African American or white. And what that did is that meant that, first of all, blacks had good schools, regardless of their income, but also it meant that you had a cadre of middle class people who were running their communities. And I, what's amazing and a story untold is that when integration came in, we decapitated the leadership of the African American community. And today it's really centered in their churches. But the but you know African Americans they would have their own lawyers they would have their own doctors they would have their own hospitals that, you know and so on now as equal separate equal well, you know about that but still we built a strong black middle class in the coal industry exactly using the rougher model for, for how you treat workers every black was paid according every person was paid according to the job not according to what color they were now they segregated had housing separate that's how my grandfather gets healed. He's an Italian who can speak English, comes through Ellis Island, comes to the coal fields, becomes a bouncer for the railroad hotel in Bluefield. Then when Prohibition comes about, he's, he, get, he buys a dry goods store. 
<laughs> you and I both know that Italians did not break dry, dry goods stores. So <laughs> during, during Prohibition, my mother goes, oh, she said, don't tell that part. But, uh, and he dies very, at a young age, but he was quite an entrepreneur. But, but that's how people came. Uh, we did have segregation. The Italians had a section. The, 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 and if you all remember growing up in the 50s and 60s, we had an incredible number of people from Eastern Europe. Hungarian families, uh, you know, uh, out in Dow County. So they recruited people in, just like the Rutgers and everybody else had to do to, to make these, these communities. To, uh, and you had coal here. Yes, sir. How many black generals came through the ROTC at West Virginia State University? Now, I'm sure you know that because of your connection. Well, West Virginia State is one of the most remarkable stories you can ever imagine. If, well, and Booker, Booker had his hands on it. They, the Morrell Act set up, uh, the original Morrell Act right after the Civil War said, went to the states and said, look, we'll give you all this government land and you can sell it if you'll use the money to set up uh, land grant institutions that, you know, about agriculture and, you know, higher education, all that, with WVU land grant. Well, West Virginia State is a land grant, but it's from the second Morrell Act for black, historic black universities in 1891. And the, the bill's going through the legislature, from Kanawha, you got a lot of it here from, from uh, Jefferson County. It's a little rough. Storer College was like Hampton Institute. It was a white school for blacks after the war. They expected to get, and, and a delegate from Kanawha County uh, made a mo an amendment that it should be built in Kanawha County. And uh, that amendment passed. So the Morrell Outcomes built the West Virginia State on lands owned by the Cavills. Now, Mr. Cavill married, in effect, one of his slaves and had numerous children by her, and when he died, he freed her and gave her all of his property. Now, he died because of his murder, by the way, uh, somewhere close, close to the war, I don't know if it was before or after the war, but anyway, he's, he's murdered, and uh, nobody ever knew who it was. The, the land was divided up among the heirs and those strips, so West Virginia State, if you've been out there, is in a strip, that's one of the original cattle heir strips. Uh, in answer to the question directly, 14 generals have gone through West Virginia State more than any other school that is not a military county in the country. Uh, and, and you say, well, they were African American. Exactly, because they started coming through. West Virginia State was, was some people would say, a, a Harvard level school for blacks. It was a very high level uh, uh, school, not original college as we have today. Uh, but, uh, but we still have a, a great quality education there, and our new president is really changing everything. But uh, West Virginia State, <coughs> Booker, Got his friend Bert Pillerman, and there's a wonderful letter in his papers. I, I, we have we went to the beach this summer, and I bought all 14 volumes of Booker's papers and read, <laughs> read them at the beach in four days. Well, not all, but but most. But there's a wonderful letter from him about Bert Pillerman, and he says, you know, he's really kind of a dull guy, but he'll really do a good job for you. So he gets Bert Pillerman, president, who is is a good president. Booker does not come to his sister's funeral. Her sister's his sister's funeral is at Canal Stevens. Presbyterian Church because Atkins Island was too small. Booker doesn't come to the funeral. I'm surprised by that, but anyway, he didn't. Bert Pillerman runs the whole thing, and it was quite a, a big affair. Lots of important people went because she was the, the sister of Booker Washington, and she was also a lot of But uh, yeah, West Virginia State's connection is pretty amazing, and they're part of it. When integration came in, the state legislature turned the state into a regional school and took away the land grant status. Well, they didn't take away, but anyway, land grant status was, was dropped. And now West Virginia State has gotten that back, and uh, we had a 50% increase in the number of freshmen enrollees this year, so we we're kind of taking off. We had budget cuts and everything else, and uh, people said, do you really think, I was the chair of the board, do you really think you can get somebody to come and be a good president of your school with the problems you've got out there, budget cuts, and your $2 million a year in the hole, and all that? And I said, well, yeah. <laughs> and by golly, we did. I, 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 I'm reminded of Bill Mazeroski in 1960, if you remember that kid. Yeah. It was two outs and two on, and it was the seventh game of the World Series against the Yankees, who were invincible. And, and Bill Mazeroski took a hit, he took a swing, and it just didn't clear the fences, it went into the river or something. My wife's aunt and uncle were there, and she said that you just, everybody thought the game was over, but anyway, and she said you heard this crack. And then when they saw it, the place just went absolutely berserk. And it is considered the greatest hit ever. 
So sometimes, you know, there are Bill Mazarowski moments in your life, and that may be one, because uh, Dr. Hemphill really is remarkable, and he's really doing a wonderful job. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. Can I be helpful? I don't care you No, I'm glad you brought up Louisville. I do have a little bit on James Craig to tell you, but no, I don't. Okay. James Craig is a remarkable man, too. I mean, the Craig Panton house is safe because it's a charming, beautiful place, not really because of its history so much. Uh, James Craig is a lawyer. His grandfather is, is George Washington's physician and best friend. He, you see the one that bled it? Yes. But anyway, so. And then uh, his father was George Washington's personal secretary while president. The problem is, is that granddad, while he was out running around with the revolution in the Revolutionary War, kind of lost the money, the family money, because you had to work farm. So there's James doesn't come here with money. There's some land out in Putnam County. He comes in. He uh, he he uh, marries a rich guy in town's daughter, Juliet Shrewsbury, Samuel's daughter. And he is a, is a lawyer, and he helps organize St. John's Church in 1834 as a vestryman. And he decides he wants to be a priest, so he becomes the, the rector there, goes to school, and becomes rector in 1839 and serves five years. And he leaves in 1844 and goes to Louisville, the Christ Church Louisville. And he's there until he dies. His son takes over and is rector of Christ Church Louisville for another way. Who was James Craig? James Craig is given credit or keeping Kentucky as a slave state in the Union. Uh, he gave a speech and he would travel all over Kentucky and when he did that, he would, uh, when he would travel around Kentucky, he would stay in legislators' homes, so he was really became a very powerful guy because he liked doing it. He's the one who set up St. Luke's in Mall with Joel Shrews, under Joel Shrewsbury's, uh, uh, her, Juliet's uncle was Joel Shrewsbury, and whose daughter, I remember, had married uh, Louis Ruffin. And he, so he's given credit for keeping Kentucky in the Union. Also, he becomes the president of the House of Deputies, which is probably the, the highest, to not be a bishop in the Episcopal Church, the highest position he could have for about 12 years. And he, uh, he is credited with bringing all the southern dioceses of, in the south that seceded when their states seceded from the National Church, bringing them in in the very first year and, and making a very smooth transition. He was very conservative. If anybody knows the history of the Episcopal Church, there was a reform group. Well, he's one of the reasons for the reform was he's very traditional, and his assistant bishop, his bishops in New York is the national bishop, his, the assistant bishop forms the new reformed Episcopal Church from Louisville. And James Craig is, is, is probably, uh, probably his conservatism as a, as a priest with him. Uh, he was, but he was very pro-slavery. He was pro-union, but he was pro-slavery. So that's interesting. Any other questions? That's everybody decided to Oh, okay. Well, if you want me to, okay, it, it is sort of a petition, isn't it? Yeah, it, let's do it. All right. Thank you. What I would like folks to do, now, it, it, really, I, I would like to have your emails would be my idea one. Thank you very much for the folks who signed up. I, I don't know if you saw it or if it got to you. I would like you to give me your email, and I'll, I'll email what we finish with. What you have there is close to what it's going to be. It's, as I say, it's a history of Mormon. Did everybody get one that's done? Uh, oh, here, here. <laughs> I numbered them to kind of keep an idea of what we have. Anybody else? Not yet. Okay. Um, could you expound on the Mary Ingalls connection to the Southern District? Okay, I, real quick. Uh, Mary Ingalls was in what's Blacksburg, Virginia. Right. And of course, Smithville Plantation was built. What we see there is really the uh, Preston Town. But it was in that location that, that, that she lived. And they, there was a massacre at her house. And they took her right, right. and her baby. And they took her back to Ohio. And one, they could get, they could sell her back. There's one reason you would do that. And also, uh, they say that, that the Indians thought that she knew how to make salt. The Native Americans wanted salt. They were shot. Oh. They lived in Ohio. So, so they bring her through. And at the salt lake, she makes salt. And that's why we say she's our first salt maker. Oh. And, and then she goes back to Ohio, and then she escapes, leaves her baby, 
Raleigh, yeah, Raleigh, and, okay. and, and comes back and this old Dutch woman's with her and the Dutch woman goes crazy and tries to kill her. That's the story of Follow the River, the Raleigh. Yeah. Very, very popular book at the time. Yeah. Now, she gets back, uh, she gets her child back, and he's been raised Native American, he wants to stay in the culture, and it's very interesting you know, how that would all work. Excuse me, her son. Yeah, I've never heard that before. And uh, uh, now one of the babies was killed, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But she is the great-grandmother of John P. Hale. And John P. Hale's Trans-Allegheny Pioneers details and is the story that Fall of the River is taken from. But John P. Hale took it from her son's writing in something like 17-whatever. And, and I've got a copy of that write up of it and, and it's, it's pretty much a story that, that he gets right, truly right. from his family. He publishes and then it becomes Fall of the River. Trans Allegheny Pioneers. If you look up, I can't remember, there are sources cited in there. If you want to read up some of the best books that I found uh, are in there. And because of the size of the brochure I couldn't list all. I mean I, I've read 150 books out of the library in the last year trying to get Always going. The Ruffner family, I should thank because they gave me most all the information I gave you. And uh, they will, they have voted to have their family reunion in, in 2015 in Malta. Wow. Yeah, yeah, that's a good mm -hmm. I'm hoping West Virginia State will you know, be a part of that. Uh, we did have the Booker e. Washington family here with, in 2002, I think, with the Ruffner family for the reunions at the same time. And we had to do it at the house. I got to meet Mrs. Clifford, who I understand has passed away now. She sort of the, was the matriarch. And you might recognize the name Clifford, J.R. Clifford, who was a great rival of Booker T. Washington. Uh, and they were contemporaries. His, their children married. I believe it. But anyway, so, but Mrs. Clifford is the head of the... And she, she came up, there was always a controversy. She came up and said, you know, that, you know that Mrs. Cooper is not really related to us. Because Mrs. Cooper always claimed to be in a way. And I said, well, I, Mrs. Cooper told me that that, uh, that she was not related by blood, but she was related by affection. And that, uh, and I said, she was such a wonderful lady, I'm sure it would be wonderful if she was a part of your family. So, but Mrs. Cooper always referred to Booker as Uncle Booker and Aunt Amanda and considered them to be a big part of her family. She did not have children. But uh, yeah, I thought that was interesting. I said, yes. I said, Mrs. Cooper told me that a lot of people in the valley thought that they were, but they certainly were very close. Right. Are you supposed to be thin or qualified? No, I don't know. Are we done? They said that oh. we needed to go straight into our meeting. I did not realize the time. I, well, my, I'll have to sh share with you. I think it was, I don't know if it was my wife or who, but I, I, I told her, I said, I've been invited. No, wait. I've spoken for an hour and a half lots of times. I've never been invited to. <laughs> it looks like I've kind of been out there. Thank you all very much. You're a great audience. Appreciate it. Thank you. Is it hard to start? It's a strange thing. It's kind of a I'm going to make up on how I'm going to From now to when that'll be available. Yeah. Well, within a week or two. Yeah. And then, and you took it from beginning to end, and it'll be on for the next break. I started drinking notes. Now back there, the camera's taking the notes. <laughs> well, it's nice, nice meeting you. Thanks for doing that. Thank <laughs> you.